Jim Idelson has been a friend of ours for, I don't know, over 20 years. And Jim is really into antennas and towers and so on. He's uh, part of the YCCC group, and uh, he really knows a lot about what's going on. And uh, he took the time to put together this great, just great uh, segment, and there's three of them. And you're going to hear number two, see number two tonight. And Jim, I really appreciate you being here, and we look forward to what you have tonight and, of course, for next week. Thanks so much, Jim. We look forward to this. Thanks, Bob. It's great to be back again for the second part of our Ham Nation series on tower safety. We have a lot of material to cover today, so let's dive right in. Last week, we learned that over a very short period of just 10 months, four lives were lost in incidents related to amateur radio tower work. We also learned that if we compare this recent fatality rate with those of other activities considered to be risky, we find ourselves to be at far greater risk. In amateur radio tower climbing, we see fatality rates four times that of professional tower construction and maintenance, and seven times what is reported in amateur skydiving. We can only conclude that we do have a problem and that we need to explore the issue further to better understand what's going on. In this second part of the series, we're going to explore the data available to us in an effort to identify specific root causes and potential solutions. So let's look at some data. Through many hours of searching the internet records and other publicly available data sources, we were able to piece together the history of fatal amateur incidents from 2003 until today. There were 14 incidents in which 16 people lost their lives. We will be asking some questions about what happened in each of these instances in our effort to discover the root causes. A quick note here about studying fatalities. Our focus is certainly not on just preventing fatalities. We need to prevent injuries as well. But while fatalities are widely reported and good information about them is often available, reporting of non-fatal injuries is very limited. We do know that for every fatality, a large number of injuries is quite likely to have occurred. With the right analysis and course of action, we're hopeful that many non-fatal injuries can also be prevented. It turns out that as we searched for tower safety incidents, we found five well-documented cases that were not fatal, but because they were quite severe and in many cases could have been fatal, we included them in our analysis. Our next step was to start asking questions about this collection of incidents. The first question we asked is about the types of towers involved. Here we see that almost three quarters of the incidents involved a guide tower. A few self-supporting towers were also involved. Next, we looked at the types of incidents that led to a fatality or serious injury. You can see here that two incident types dominate. Falling with a tower while attached, that's the 50% indicated in red, and Free fall, that's falling to the ground without any form of restraint. That's the 37% shown in yellow. There was one case of electrocution and another case of being injured by the tower itself. A very interesting statistic appears when we look at the type of work that was being done when the incident happened. Nearly 60% of these incidents occurred during the construction or removal of the tower itself. Think about the life of a tower. Construction and demolition of the tower are typically done in just one or two days, while maintenance operations occur on many days over many, many years. This is an interesting pattern that needs to be explored further. So let's take a look at the types of incidents that occur in the construction phase versus what happens in the maintenance phase. When we are constructing or removing towers, we see that 90% of the incidents are of the falling with the tower type. So the tower falls over with you attached. 
When we look at the incidents that happen during the maintenance phase of the tower's life, we see that the dominant incident type is free fall. If we take a closer look and review the reports of each of the individual incidents and then look at them in aggregate, a couple of clear root causes emerge. When we're talking about falling with a tower, we see that in every case, the tower was not safe for climbing. And in the case of falling from a tower, we see that the climber was either not wearing the proper equipment for safe climbing or for some reason did not use proper climbing procedure while on the tower. And we have another additional category. We call it unsafe maneuvers. In these cases, the incident reports tell us that the work was being done without the right knowledge, without the right people, or the right tools. This is our final numbers chart. It shows that almost 50% of incidents result from climbing an unsafe tower, and another 37% result from a lack of proper fall protection equipment or the failure to use it correctly. One additional very important point to note is that every unsafe tower incident involved a guide tower. To highlight the importance of these two root causes, I'm going to refer to them as a deadly duo. Okay, now let's talk about the two root causes and what can be done about them. Let's talk about unsafe guide towers first. We knowingly climb unsafe guide towers. The key word here is knowingly. It turns out that during construction and removal of a guide tower, we often unwittingly expose ourselves to great risk. The data shows that this happens when we're working with the lowest 30 to 40 feet of the tower. What's the intuition when it comes to that lower 30 feet? When the tower's going up, we think, hey, it's only temporary. It only needs to stay up like this for a short time. I can trust the base or that light rope to keep the tower vertical while I'm on it until I get to the first permanent guy point. And when taking the tower down, it's the reverse. I can take these last guys off and trust the base. And then I'll disassemble the last few sections. It'll hold. And then it doesn't hold. The other case where we see this kind of disaster is during temporary tower installations. Our incident data in this category includes one fatality on field day and a near fatal injury that happened on a de-expedition. In both cases, Towers were supported by rope guys and weak anchors. So what's the answer? A guide tower must be truly safe to climb. Even when it's a temporary installation or during installation or removal of a permanent tower. And safe to climb means properly guide always. Temporary guys are often required. But the important point to understand here is that temporary does not mean poor. We need real anchors, wire rope, and reliable terminations. You never guy a tower you intend to climb with rope. Temporary guys should be installed at, the, at very conservative vertical spacing and tensioned as if they will be permanent. If the anchors can't take the tension, then the tower isn't climbable. Bottom line. If you're going to climb a tower, it needs to be solidly guided. Here's how we recently removed the last 40 feet of a Roan 45 tower. In this case, there was a tower section in concrete at the base, plus four full sections above that. A single set of guy wires were attached to the middle of the, of the upper section, section A in the picture you see here. So what did we do? First, we set some temporary guys just below section B, just at the top of section C. And we moved the upper guys that were the original permanent guys down below to the middle of section D. So now we have two sets of guy wires holding this tower up. We climb up, remove sections A and B. And then we come back down and remove that upper set of temporary guys, leaving one set of guys 
holding the tower very, very securely. And then we climb down the tower, release that set of guys. Nobody's on the tower at this point. And we took the rest of the tower down by cutting the legs at the base and letting the, the two remaining sections fall. One last point about guide tower bases. As you look at these bases, I hope you realize that trusting an existing base is a risky thing to do. Damage may not be visible. It's best to assume that the base won't hold the tower vertical and you've got to use those temporary guys. So at this point, we've addressed the problem of falling while attached to a failing guide tower. Now we need to address the second of the deadly duo, falling off a tower to the ground unrestrained. In these cases, what we're talking about is the problem of free climbing. Many of us older hams share a romanticized view of what free climbing is simply scampering up a tower without the aid of any climbing gear at all. Some of us did that for years, and some of us still do it today. Like this guy. But free climbing isn't just carefree and gear-free climbing. We now have a real definition provided to us by OSHA and other industry experts. It's a much stricter definition. The concept is you must be 100% attached. If you're ever not po positively attached to a solid part of the tower by a proper high strength lanyard, then you are free climbing. These are all examples of free climbing. Some of these people are wearing climbing gear, but either the gear or the technique puts them in the free climbing category. Look at this guy, for example. He has uh, apparently uh, run up the tower to deliver a rope or to untangle a rope, and he's not connected at all. Look at this. It's field day. And on field day, we have rope guy wires, and we have a guy up at about 20 feet, and he is not attached. He's uh, apparently thinking about attaching a positioning lanyard. And another field day situation. This guy is uh, potentially um, able to be uh, properly attached to the tower, but it does not look like he is. He's got a full body harness on, but he's only got a positioning lanyard uh, that he's leaning back on. So he's not properly attached. There's another. And then there's this guy here. He is, um, he is standing on the top plate of a Roan 25 tower at about 80 feet and he's connected with two, two short positioning lanyards. Uh, that is not a very safe situation to be in. That's me. And that's me in about uh, 1997. So what is 100% attach? 100% attach requires two things. It requires that you have the right equipment, that full body harness, and that you use it properly all the time. A full body harness and a dual fall arrest lan at lanyard enable you to maintain 100% attach. And careful attention to how you climb and move around the tower will ensure that th that safety equipment can do its job if it's ever needed. Here's a short video showing the harness and how it's used. Okay, so now we move to current day approved equipment, personal protection equipment. This thing is called a full body harness. It's made by a manufacturer called DBI Sala. They're a division of 3M. This is the thing you wear, and it, so it's over the shoulder and around the legs, and it has the positioning belt. The belt is actually not considered part of the safety design. The safety design is all about the, the strapping that goes around the, the, the weight bearing part of, part of the design. Now, you still have to be attached. We haven't done any attachment with this yet. This is the thing that does the attachment. This is called a dual fall arrest lanyard. Okay. It attaches up at the top. So this, this is, this D ring here would be on your back. All right. And you attach this thing like that. 
and as you climb, I should just put the thing on, shouldn't I? <laughs> okay. Okay, so there we go. So this thing is on now. And <laughs> normally you, you climb with one of these over each shoulder. All right, so, this, so again, here we're, we're climbing and we're alternating and you always have one of these hooked on. And then the last thing is, this is a, um, this is a positioning thing. This goes around the tower and you connect over here. That's a work, yeah, it's a work positioning thing. And this one is kind of cool because it's adjustable. So you can, sometimes you want to be real uptight and sometimes you want to be leaning further back. So that's what the equipment looks like. Now I thought I'd give you a quick view of what it looks like in actual use. This is um, a quick demo that I did um, using that equipment and on my tower at about 30 feet. What you see here is two camera views. Uh, one on the left is a drone view, and we're looking at a spot where guy wires attach down below, and there's a side mount antenna. So there's lots of hardware to climb around here on my way up to a point higher on the tower. So right now you can see the, uh, the fall arrest lanyard is connected up above me. I've disconnected the, uh, the positioning lanyard and I'm starting to move up. As I move up, I alternate between uh, using each of the fall arrest lanyards until I get to the position that I'm uh, trying to be in. And eventually get to the point where I can get myself uh, reattached with the, uh, with the positioning lanyard. You see right here, right now, I think uh, we're going to get that positioning lanyard back around the tower and clipped into my belt. So that's how you stay safe in terms of climbing. You've got to get the correct equipment in your hands and on your body and then you have to use it correctly every time you climb the tower, even when it's a little bit inconvenient. If you remember, there was one last category of incident types that we found in the fatality and injury data, and that was what we called unsafe maneuvers. I'll just touch on this briefly. In the history of fatalities and injuries that we explored, we learned about a fatality in which a small crew was using limited rigging and attempting to take down a 350 pound 40 meter Yagi from a 100 foot guide tower. Unfortunately, the antenna fell, it severed an upper guy wire, and the tower buckled and the climber lost his life as the tower came down. In another incident, a family was attempting to raise an antenna support structure that was to be bracketed to the side of the house. They lost control of the structure and it fell on a nearby high voltage power line, taking the lives of three members of the same family. So what can we do about these kinds of situations? They vary so much in terms of what actually happened, but at their core, they are often the result of taking on a task without the necessary knowledge, people, and tools. The answer is in changing the way we think about these activities. Every antenna or tower project we take on needs to be considered carefully and with the help of an experienced team. It's difficult, but it's so important to recognize when a job is simply beyond what you are capable of doing and when it's time to turn it over to the experts. That's all I have for you today on the causes and the solutions. At this point, it's time to look to the future. Where do we go from here? Last week, we learned about this problem in our community, a serious problem that really deserves our attention. And this week, we learned about this deadly duo of two relatively simple things with simple solutions, which so unfairly took our friends and our colleagues from us. 
And we also sense that the rate of these incidents and injuries is on the rise. So what can we do? Where do we go from here? Being safe will require us to change. Behaving as we have in the past can no longer be the accepted norm. Safety is a mindset. It's a new way of thinking. Safety is a choice that we have to make individually and collectively. And it's a commitment. Changing the way we behave won't happen overnight. We have to stick with it until it becomes a part of us. Let's talk about that mindset. Each of these points requires that safety be top of mind. Take a look at the last two points, being responsible and being strong. These aren't easy. When you're working with people who have not made the leap yet, what are you going to do? Well, here's what I've done. What you see in the pictures is just an outward appearance, but there's much more going on that you can't see in the images. The most important point is that I made the choice. I decided to make necessary changes and to accept the costs. Of course, I upgraded my equipment and that came along with a hard dollar cost. I made the choice to prioritize that expense above other things I would have loved to have purchased instead. And I accepted the soft costs as well, the added time and the extra effort required to do my tower work. I've also let friends who work with me know that I expect them to be properly equipped and knowledgeable when they come to assist. So now that you've heard my story, I'll turn it over to you and ask what you plan to do to help make a difference. Are you a tower climber? Is this the moment for you to upgrade your gear? Are you a non-climbing tower owner? Should you pay more attention to the way work is being done on your tower and antennas? What steps will you take to help make tower work safe for all of us? Next week, in our last episode, we'll shift the discussion to the question of how we can initiate change across our large and diverse community of 800,000 licensees. With 38,000 towers out there and many thousands of climbers, plus field day participants and organizers and all those among us who do antenna work, we need a strategy to make things happen. So as always, I look forward to hearing all your feedback and suggestions and comments. Thanks to all of Ham Nation for listening in and see you next week. That was absolutely wonderful. And as we said in the beginning, uh, we need more of this and we will do more of this uh, here on Ham Nation. And I appreciate all of your time. I can't imagine how many months and hours <laughs> it took you to put this together, Jim. And you still got a lot more coming next week, right? I do. I do. Really looking forward to talking about the things we as a community can do to solve to solve these problems there's a, there's a lot we can do and um uh, the good news is that out of this data you know we really see some core issues and they're addressable i think that many of the situations that we put ourselves in 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 doing this kind of work are preventable so yes. um uh we'll, we'll we'll do that yeah it's it's I wonderful have, there, there are a couple of questions, one, at least one or two comments in the chat room that we could talk about. Okay, go ahead. Jim, I have a question for you. My, this is my, <laughs> this is my, uh, my chat room assistant, subbing All in for right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, Brett. Brett's uh, question about about a lifeline. Okay, so so I yes I talk about using a, a full body harness and a um, and these dual fall arrest lanyards. The reason that that's good and it's good on my tower and a lot of ham towers is because you may have um, equipment mounted at different points on the tower. So on my tower I have rotators at several different levels. 
the concept of that lifeline is that you you put a, a strong line attached very securely at the top of the tower, and then you have this one grabby thing, I, an ascender, that you connect to that lifeline, and you can go up and down the tower without having to do the lanyard stuff back and forth. You are securely attached to that lifeline. Where that gets to be trouble is that in many tower situations for hams, the amount of equipment on the tower makes it hard for that lifeline to route easily all the way top to bottom. It's not always a convenient option. However, I would definitely say it is an option for in situations where it can work and it makes the climbing a little easier. Well, it makes it a lot easier because you don't have to bounce back and forth with that um, with that dual dual lanyard. Yeah, okay. Uh, are there any other ones? Let me see if there's anything else in there. I uh, want to know. Uh, yeah. Jim, they wanted to know if you plan to publish these uh, so that we could have them in a segment that could be used for ham clubs or whatever. Do you have uh, any plans for that? I got I got to tell you, Bob, um, I have been responding to um, to uh, requests for club meeting presentations ever since the first time I did the thing. Um, I'm working on condensing it down to a presentation that's of a you know reasonable size so that it can be done in half an hour. Um, so yes, yes, we're going to have this available. We'll have slides available that could be delivered by by anybody, and we'll have video available that's shorter and more you know more concise so that a video can be presented at a club meeting as well. Sure. Well, when you get that together, why come on the show again and we'll talk about just that particular. Uh, uh, program that you have put together. Yep, we, we'll um, there. One of the things we want to do is come on with some frequency, some regularity. We want to have this kind of discussion become part of our culture. That it should always be there. If we're there talking about it just before somebody decides to go and and do something out in their tower, they'll be thinking of this. So yeah. we so share of mind and awareness is a big part of the solution. Yeah, absolutely. Gordo, uh, you're still with us. What, what do you have, Gordo? Well, you know, everything that Jim points out is so appropriate for those of us that go, oh, my gosh, the the director is like leaning slightly 20 degrees off a big crow or whatever sat on it. Let me just go up there and free climb up there, push that director up and. So, Jim, uh, now we're going to take a second thought about just jumping up 20 or 30 feet. And it would be interesting to see um, how many hams uh, have been injured or lost their life by free climbing maybe only 20 or 30 feet to uh, fix that drooping director or whatever they're doing. But, boy, let me tell you, the first two sections of this tower safety seminar has really uh, gained attention of hams that, like me, and I have two towers, they're aluminum, but still I climb them, although they're all the ways uh, retracted. Uh, but I go up there just to adjust something, and I've really got nothing but a positioning belt, not the full safety harness. So for 500 bucks. You bet. That's on my Christmas list, Jim. Okay, great, Gordo. Uh, you're doing the right things. Uh, getting you to think about this is really the goal. And uh, next week when we talk, we'll have some ideas about how maybe you can um, acquire the equipment um, and and get some training. And all those things are going to start to come into play. So um, glad you're pleased with what we're doing. Uh, the reactions have been phenomenal. So thank you, everybody. Oh. and. Uh, we'll see you guys all next week. Let's see. Is well, Don still there? Is Don Don with us? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I uh, I get antsy around stepladders, so you will not find me on a tower. <laughs> um, I I have uh, I was involved with one tower climb. We were doing a, a, a repeater antenna on the New Orleans VHF Club, up at about seven hundred feet, I think, five or six, seven hundred feet. And believe me, it was all professionally done, all the safety gear, uh, all the I's were dotted, all the T's were crossed, and no chances were, were taken, period. And that's yeah. the way it has to be. Uh, absolutely. We're saving lives by talking about this. We're absolutely saving lives. I'm firmly convinced of it. 
And you know, uh, this is something we should have talked about a long time ago. There's two two points I want to make. Uh, you triggered one, Don. Um, one is that this is a an issue that cuts across all of our different parts of our community. This is not just a DXers and contesters problem. This is not just a repeater owners problem. Um, it's a, it's all of us. You know, antennas are and towers are the lifeblood of what we do. So it's important across our whole community. I think that's worth mentioning. Second yeah. thing is, Gordo, Gordo you, you mentioned um, problems that can happen just a few feet off the ground. Well, you'll note that in the, in the talk, um, I mentioned that the falling with a tower usually happens in 30, within 30 or 40 feet. Turns out it's more, the injuries are much more severe when you come down with a tower and the tower lands on you. Not just, not just you falling to the ground. So, so being close to the ground doesn't make you safer. <laughs> um, and and second thing is, I'm just, I'll tell you about a personal experience. I this summer I I made a small mistake. I fell down. I fell off my tower. I fell off my tower at like the the lowest rung. I had I misstep <laughs> and I fell and I fell backwards and I you know I fell I fell on my back. But it was just from about a foot or two off the ground, and it hurt. You know, my yeah. leg hit the hit the concrete base pretty hard. It was tough. So, the height of injury, the height that you fall from, don't be you know don't be uh, fooled. Uh, you can get seriously hurt from just a few feet off the ground. Absolutely. Right, 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 absolutely. Right. Well, we really appreciate all you're doing. I look forward to next week. And uh, we're, we definitely will continue. And for anybody that would like to use this, I, I should mention this. You are absolutely free to pull up any piece of, like we did with the pine board. Uh, Leo Laporte is so kind to, to not uh, copyright all this for him. It's yours. The Ham Nation is your show. And any piece of it, why, they will be able to, you'll be able to do that. 